All right, well, if anyone's bored like I am while we're sitting here in front of a chessboard waiting, I'll show you my game from last night, which was a fun and exciting one. This is not part of the lecture, this is just, just candy. Um, uh, against a young guy, I don't know how young he was, but it looked to me like maybe middle school or I don't know, fifth grade or <laughs> never, always gotta be careful of these guys. Um, but I, I managed to, overwhelm him. So this was a, this was a sort of opening where you give up the center and then hopefully punch me back in the mouth. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way for him. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is kind of a very sharp opening that some of you may- Yeah, all books so far. Yeah, this is a book line actually, um, but it's a crazy line. I uh, like that one. Yeah, he, that's where I get lost here. I'm not going to go into great detail here, just because we're we're going to start soon. But you know, he did well punching me in the center here. But just briefly at this point in time, you know, we got opposite sides castling. He's going to try to come after me. I'm going to try to come after him. We're both. Um, developed but he's a little behind in development and it's hard for him to get his queenside pieces out because of my pawn in the middle and restricts some of his guys uh, which then prevents his rook from getting out so he's a little bit jumbled up here and right now he makes a mistake of starting to waste some pawn moves and so i just kind of go for the throat and um and now i got a nice rook line open on his king Welcome people that are showing up. I'm just showing a little candy here to play around. This is my game from last night. We haven't really started the lecture. So just enjoy the, the fun of this game until, until uh, we can officially begin. Um, it's, um, here come the remaining guys. You know, as you can see, I'm almost fully developed. Even my, a, my H1 rook, which hasn't moved, is fully developed because of the open file. Um, and he starts pawn grabbing before he's full, fully developed. So I just keep moving my guys in. And the end is near. So he defends that pawn over in front of his king, but he also opens up my route. In. And the final move is Kind of unexciting, but very effective, <laughs> which is just uh, bringing my last, last fellow in. And that's going to be mate next move. So hope you guys enjoyed that little miniature from last night. I see Zach Thompson on the call. Was he? No, he wasn't there last night. I'm thinking of someone else. So Mel and, Mel and Mark, you guys are on it. Do you usually wait till a little after 7.30 or should we dive in? What do you think? I mean, whenever you're ready to go, uh, Kevin, after 7.30, sometimes you start a little late, um, but um, a lot of times you start on time. So whatever, you know, whatever you feel comfortable, go ahead. All right, I'll wait. I see, I see a couple more people popping on, so I'll just wait just a couple minutes to see, but we won't start too late, fellas. Thanks for being on time for those that have have come. While, um, while we're waiting to, um, uh, I'll just Hello. say, please feel free to use the chat button through Zoom if you want to throw out some questions as I'm talking, if you don't feel like interrupting. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely be watching those uh, chat uh, windows. And if you um, have a question or um, if I'm asking a question, feel free to just verbally shout it out too. It's pretty informal. If you can you hear me? If you're annoying me, I'll mute you. <laughs> awesome.
right. Well, let's, uh, I guess I'll get started. I'll just introduce myself in case a few people um, come in late. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Mark, for opening the chat there. Um, so yes, welcome. Uh, this is a um, lecture put on by the Pittsburgh Chess Club. Uh, thanks to Mark and Mel for organizing. Um, I've been an active member in the Pittsburgh Chess Club now for um, a little while, but not, not as long as some other guys, maybe five years or somewhere around there. Um, I've lived in Pittsburgh now for uh, maybe 15 or 16 years, uh, coming here for grad school. I was originally from Michigan. Um, and when I was in grad school, I was pretty busy, so I wasn't really playing much active chess, which was a great pain to me because I played a lot in high school. Um, I started playing competitively as a sophomore in high school, junior in high school, and uh, kind of became obsessed. I loved it. I love the competition. I love the game. I love the strategy. I love the puzzles. It's just always been my thing. And it was a great fit for me, just sort of psychologically and, and really a great time. So I got into it. I studied a lot. I got up over 2000 in a couple of years of high school and tied for the Michigan Junior Championship. My second year, my first year, I was unrated. And my second year, I tied for first, um, including a draw against a 2400 rated junior. Um, so that was kind of, that was my peak. And then I went to college and got busy and did some other stuff. And now I got a family and, and uh, you know, I work as a psychiatrist. So, so I got away from it for a while, but once my life settled down a little bit, I got much back into it five years ago. And I'd, I'd always kind of watched games here and there in the same way that people watch sports. So I, I still kind of kept in touch with the whole chess world, but started competing again about five years ago seriously and, and wanted to improve my rating and get better and, and have found the Pittsburgh chess scene really a great place to do that. Um, just very active scene, very nice people, good tournaments, uh, great competition, great places to play on uh, the Pitt campus uh, with the Pittsburgh Chess League. Uh, Pittsburgh Chess Club has lots of good tournaments. Um, and uh, so I found it a great place to improve and, and get better. So nothing but great things to say about the Pittsburgh scene. And, um, and uh, my, my general sort of home game, if you want to call it that, is the Tuesday night tournament, which I've played a lot in over the last years uh, because it's not that much commitment. So, you know, one nice long game once a week and, um, you know, not a whole weekend blown. So um, that's been a good fit for me. So with that introduction, uh, thanks for everyone uh, for coming and recognize a few names here. Um, hello to Paul. Uh, I, I entered one of your games in my database today, so welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, as I, as I said, feel free to uh, interact and, and throw questions out there. I'm not going to be really too tactical today in my discussion. Um, you know, tactics are a very important part of chess. It's important to study. And when I say tactics, I mean, I move here, you move there, and then I take your knight or I checkmate you. Um, that's all well and good. You need to know that stuff um, and you need to practice that stuff. But it's, a, it's not as fun to do that, I think, in a lecture because uh, it's very specific. You know, if you practice a tactic, can you really use that strategy tomorrow or in your next game? Not necessarily. I mean, these tactics do have patterns and uh, pattern recognition is an important thing in chess. So, you know, if you really do see these similar tactics over and over again, you will see them in your game. But as far as a, you know, one or two hour lecture, I'm not gonna make a big impact on that. So I really wanna look at a few more st strategic uh, ideas in games that will come up over and over again. And uh, I'm gonna focus on those uh, today. Um, and tactics will kind of come into play, but I'm not going to go into great detail. I'm not going to sort of sit here and ask you for hours to think about what's the best move and why. Um, we'll have a couple opportunities to do that, but uh, really I want to focus on some, some really general ideas. I found that in my um, chess career as it is, when I am very much balancing general strategic ideas, and the narrative of where the game's going and what the pieces are doing and what's happening. I'm balancing that with specifically where they're going and what they're taking and all the tactics. I'm doing well. And when I forget the strategic aspects and I get too much into the nitty gritty of what goes where and who captures who, 
it's very easy to go astray and it's very easy to make mistakes and it's very easy to um, attack when you should not be attacking mm -hmm. and um, kind of rush in and unbalance the position in a way that can easily backfire even against weaker opponents. And I have, a, I have some examples that where I just, I tried to force the issue in a way that was not appropriate. Um, so with that said, um, first, first sort of strategic idea uh, that I'm going to show you in a couple games is what I call the lockout. And the lockout basically is a way of restricting someone's piece or pieces uh, to your advantage. And lockouts are very important because when you can win material, great, good for you. But, you know, most people, once you pay, play competitive chess for a while, it's not that easy to, to just win pieces. Um, as you can see in this checkmate I have on the board here from last night, material is pretty even, actually. We, we both have three minor pieces, two knights and a bishop. We both have two rooks, both have queen. He's got, actually got a couple extra pawns. And yet he's totally lost. So um, it's not that easy to win pieces, but sometimes when you can restrict and keep something out of the game, you have an effective majority. We're gonna look at a couple examples of those first, and then we'll get to some fun attacks, but we're not gonna to get to the specifics of how to kill. We're gonna look for, when do you know how to attack? How do you, get, how do you set up the necessary um, elements? so that your attack is likely to succeed, then you gotta drive it home yourself, but uh, you have to at least uh, set the table before you eat. Okay, so first, the lockout. Okay, I'm not gonna put the moves over here, that would be cheating, so I'm just gonna sort of roll through this game somewhat, you know, modest pace until we get to a, an important point here. This is myself, uh, Kevin Carl versus Vesil Prokov, and this is a queen's gambit type opening. You may have seen this kind of opening before. It's just standard opening. P people are developing their pieces sort of naturally. Nobody's done anything too stupid yet. We're just getting our guys out. We're trying to control the center. We're trying to get our bishops to effective places. Um, here he trades off my bishop for his knight, which is you know, sort of a roughly equal trade. Um, here I'm going after his bishop. He trades it off. I could take with the pawn or the queen. It's not relevant to this lecture. Uh, queen's probably a little better, but in any case, he trades off here. And a castle in a minute. He tries to find a good place for his bishop. Okay, so let's just stop for a second. Nothing crazy has happened. We've developed some pieces. I've got some more pawns in the center. I have a slight advantage. White typically gets that with they, when they have the um, uh, first move. Uh, so my pieces are reasonably developed. Next is probably gonna be trying to figure out where I put my rooks. Do I expand in the center? Do I try to push forward in the middle or what? There's a number of different options here. Um, He's reasonably developed. His his knight is doesn't have many places to go, as you can see. His bishop is is reasonably placed, and he's going to be doing the same thing for his rooks. Um, very likely to take place would be probably a, the move pawn to e5 at some point to try to put some pressure and open up some lines in the middle where his rooks can live. Um, that would, that's, probably the most effective plan. Maybe trying to get c5 in would be reasonable to pawn to c5. Let me see if I can do this. Let's see if I know how to do uh, arrows here. Does that work? Okay, so pawn to c5 or pawn to e5 would be sort of general strategies that he might be shooting for. But he, 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 he got astray in this game. So let's see what happens. Uh, so I brought my rook to the center, very logical. He, if he pushes pawn to e5, then this file is going to open up, and that's exactly where I want my rook. Uh, or I might push that pawn, depending on the situation. So a very logical move. He does the same. I move my pawn forward, gain a little extra space in the center. 
And now he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> okay, his, his rook's stuck in the corner up here. Um, he doesn't know if he wants to push e5 yet. I'm not sure. He, he plays a very strange move here. Mm. Bishop a6. This is, this is not a good move. Um, he's preventing me from pushing c5 because then I would lose my bishop on the other side of it. But that's about it. And that's a, it doesn't really attack the center. It doesn't open any lines. This guy was um, help. Yes. I have a question. Yes, sir. So he, maybe he should not play work on f to d8. Maybe he should play work on to e8 and then put the work on a to e d8. You know what I mean? So basically this rook here. Yeah, and, and then the put the rook there. on there. Maybe that's the better, better way. Probably better, yeah. I agree. Yeah. It makes sense. You bring your rooks to useful places rather than moving pieces that are already developed. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Agreed. Instead, he, he gets led astray. The question is, how do I punish this? Because I do want to punish this. I just bring my pieces out. You know, sometimes it's not the right idea to immediately try to punish a bad move. You should just keep playing reasonable moves. So he does this. Strange looking move, but what do we think is the purpose of this? Quick guesses. Why rook c8? Take d4. What was that? Maybe take d4 or something like that in there with the knight opening up the rook, but that's stupid anyhow. Yeah, the knight's got to move. Good point. Knight's got to move, and then the pawn could come forward, and then the rook looks a little more useful. So right now, I know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to move this knight somewhere. And he's going to try to push that pawn. So I move here, which is a fork, actually, meaning I have two pieces at once. And he's got two moves. He can bring his bishop back, or he can block it with his knight. So he goes back. So that just shows it was a dumb move to begin with, right? What happened if, what happened if he goes to the knight? It does the bishop. What would you do? He goes knight here. So it's a good question. Um, generally speaking, um, when someone makes a move, you should always be asking yourself, what are the consequences of that move? Mm -hmm. Some good, some bad. The good of that is he protects his bishop. The bad of that is it moves away from the center. So off the top of my head, the most logical move, I'm not saying it's the best, would be knight e5. Yeah. You make space for me, I move mm -hmm. in. Next move, bishop f3. You know, I'm or taking Or you threat need a knight to d7. A four. I threaten knight to d7? I, I mean, not a four, my bad. Yeah. So if, right. if he played c4, for instance, yeah. you know, actually, I could do that right now. There's now, now we're in the tactics phase. You know, we could do something yeah. like this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And now, if the pawn takes, then I take his knight. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's tactics yeah. that come up here, but the basic idea again is you move out of the center, I move in the center. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But this is called a lockout. So the question is, where does the lockout come in? Uh, hold on. That's, this is what he did. Wait. No, oh, no, he did this. Sorry. There we go. Mm. Back up. All right. So he now he plays knight a. Now I played. Okay. Back up. Here's the real game. Queen a4. Bishop back. Too many arrows. Now c5. Okay. So I don't want him to play c5 because if I give him time and he pushes c5, then his rook will be active, right? Mm -hmm. so I don't want to do that. What I want to do is this, where if he takes me now. Look at my beautiful rook here. And all I got is targets over here on the queen side. It's going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. So he doesn't want to do that. And now mm -hmm. he cannot play c5 anymore either. I also opened up my bishop. You see, everything's, everything's kind of opening up here. Pieces are in good places. I'm not winning yet, though. He plays knight a5. He wants to open up his bishop. And here is where we want to think about the lockout. That's the theme, all right? So let's, let's look at this and think if anybody has any ideas or is there anything brewing in this position now? 
for, for, for kind of pushing pieces um, out of the game. Um, you can start playing to e5s. Knight to e5. That's in fact. Yeah, threaten e. Uh, stitch that. Or c6. I like no, threaten it. The next move would be stitch that. Stitch that. After knight e5. Maybe that's the idea. Very good. Those are both excellent moves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think technically c6 is best. Uh, in the game, I played this. I don't huh. even know if I thought about it much. It just seems like a very logical move. Again, you leave the center, I move in the center. Mm -hmm. um, so very good. Thanks to D Dan uh, for that comment. So what ended up happening is the same. He just moved back and now we have this. <laughs> and now let's, let, let's, let's just take a look at this position now. And we can kind of guess what his next move will be, right? I'm attacking his rook. He's probably going to come over here. And now let's just think about this position for a second. This is an illustration of the lockout after all. Um, this pawn is very annoying <laughs> on c6 because his bishop is totally blocked in. Yeah. His knight, assuming I don't lose the pawn, cannot come back anywhere. He can, the knight can come to c4, this square, but not if I keep somebody covering it. And it's very hard to get these rooks out with these pawns all stuck. So basically with a couple pieces, I've eliminated his ability to really use about half of his army. Uh, interestingly, he resigned here. <laughs> I think he was so frustrated. This is a great way to win a game is just complete demoralization. Uh, I, I mentioned I'm a psychiatrist. And that must be my, my sick twisted uh, idea. There's nothing more fun than having someone just totally say, I'm done with this game, I give up. It's fun to checkmate people too, but um, this is this is really satisfying when they just say, I can't move anything. Um, you know, just to give you a couple ideas after Rook B8, you know, what I was sort of planning, this, this knight is not permanent on, oops, this knight is not permanent on E5. He can always kick it away with F6. So, I could just reroute it to something like this. Now this is permanent. That guy's never moving. That guy's never moving. That guy's never moving. And I'm keeping back half his army. So at this point in time, I could almost take my queen and my rooks and these pawns. And I could just bring them all over to the middle and on the king side. And I could just ram them down his throat. And there's nothing he can do about it because the bishop can't play the rook. Can play a little bit, the knight can't play. I'm effectively a couple pieces and some pawns up. Um, it's still a game he should have played on, but but again, the lockout was very demoralizing. Simple concept. Any questions? Okay, you got the idea. Let's go to the next one. Oh, there is there's one question. Uh, why not? Knight d7, threatening to exchange the rook on b8. Aha. Yes. OK, let me, let me get back to that one second. Oh, OK. Yep, good idea. Here, knight d7. What do we think? It looks to win the exchange, right? The rook's got nowhere to go. Knight's threatening it. Might be able to trade it off. Good idea. But just rook takes d7, and can we take the pawn eventually? So you could just take it like this and then try to win it later. That's possible. And then, you know, you'd have a three point knight plus a pawn, which is four equals a rook. A couple of problems with this tactically. For one, this c7 pawn is going to be in trouble. Um, so, you know, for instance, if he does this, I'm just going to do this pretty toast here. Um, the other, but the other is, is just more of a, a lockout strategy. Basically, um, it, it frees up some of his pieces. Uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm not. What did we take up with the bishop sees that? Can you do this? Yeah. 
Now, if I take the rook, you know, you lose the queen, right? Yeah. And if I take the bishop, then you can take the knight. Why not the queen? The pin, did you not? Take it here. No, a uh, black take with the queen. Take okay, okay. So take here, take here. Yeah, keep the pleasure. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah. So really, you know, in this case, tactically that does not quite work out. Um, but. You know, many people say that if you can get a really strong knight, sometimes it's not worth the same as a rook. Even though this guy's worth five, technically, right now, you know, if I get to a position like this, you know, this this knight is very handy. It's more useful maybe than just three points because it just holds everything back. But these are all good points. Let's keep moving. Okay, next one is Schragen versus Carl. I'm black in this case. I'm just gonna kind of zip to the important bits here. This is a Queens Indian kind of opening. I trade off my bishop for his knight so I can get better control over the light squares in the middle of the board here. Can you flip the board? Do you click the from your point of view? There we go. Thank better? You. So I control the center squares here at the expense mm -hmm. of my, and I also damage his pawn structure a bit. So just developing my guys here. Nothing too crazy going on. He's doing the same. Okay, now here's where we begin. Okay, let's stop here for a second. So I've <coughs> pushed back his bishop and I've occupied the center. My knight's got a nice square here, supported by the bishop. And, but you know, his position doesn't look that bad. Um, but I already have an idea here. Now, can anyone guess who's getting to get locked out of this game? <laughs> anyone like to throw out a guess verbally or in the, in the chat? Who's looking at risk there? The light squared bishop, says Zach. Light squared bishop, um is going to be hard to lock out so i'm not sure that's right he, he's got some squares here and you know he, he's not not saying he's good actually in this type of pawn structure he often is terrible because i can push c5 and i can sometimes target the c4 square which is weak that's a great point and you're right that you can win a lot of games with that with this structure um so he's a bad bishop but not a lock out bishop necessarily, at least not yet. How about h5, h4? h5, h4, too, so to target the dark bishop. Yeah. Over here. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, that's a good idea, except he probably will play h3 and bishop h2, maybe. So how will I? That'll chase him, but no one necessarily lock him. I'll keep the uh, knight off of f3. Sorry, I don't understand that. Keep the knight off f3. F6, remember. I'm just waking up, guy. Okay. Um, yeah, you're guarding knight on the king side. Push it out. All right, let's see what happens. He goes after the knight, and I do this to defend it. Now, now it's lockout. Now, does anyone see some lockout opportunities? Let's see. All right, let's go a little farther. He takes, this is not a good move, but this is already a very critical position for him. Um, he's, um, he's trying to kind of exchange some pressure here. So we look here and we say, okay, he traded off some guys. He was a little nervous. A little worried about my pawns coming at him. He just traded off some people, so that's all good. Actually, he's totally lost here, um, even though material is completely even. And it has to do with uh, the lockout. Can anyone see the lockout now? Is it forming in there <sighs> around the edges? Is it the knight? It is not the knight. No. <laughs> good guess. 
No, the night nights are very hard to lock out. Actually, I got a my next game was the night lockout. There's two lockouts in the next game, but um, it is the bishop. Okay, so this bishop has a backboard here with the f2 and the h2 pawns, which prevent it from um, going backwards. And going forwards is also tough because I've got all these squares covered very nicely. And so let's see how I can lock that dude out of the game. Queen f6, this is a good strong move, which is threatening what? If it were my move again, I like to move and not just lock out, but win a piece. How would I do that? Okay, let's make a dumb move here. Can I do this? Almost. Except he, now he has that square. Oops, that's annoying. Okay, Matt Bradley, very good. Take the knight. Just lost a bishop. Got no retreat squares. Okay, so that's, that's what's at stake. That's why he's basically lost. So he doesn't play rook a2, he plays that, which is a good move because now he's got an escape square, right? I'm not gonna win that bishop anymore. But you know what, it doesn't matter. You don't need to win a bishop that can be completely locked out of the game. So I played this, he castled, took that knight just like Brad's suggestion first. I don't need that knight bouncing around, no need. And now I'm a piece up. There's absolutely nothing he can do to get this bishop out of the game. Take five free moves for a white. Doesn't matter. You'll never get this bishop out of the game. As long as I don't do something stupid and I keep pawns on these two squares, you'll never get him out. So he's a piece down. The end of the game is sort of irrelevant. Um, but basically, he's a piece down now. I can, I got my knight, I can maneuver him wherever I want, I can castle, get my pieces out, that guy's not going anywhere. And in fact, some of these pawns are very weak too, so anyways, that's a whole other issue. Any questions? Again, I don't want to take too much time on each game, there's a lot of cool patterns to look at here. I'll show you the, at the end if you're interested. Actually, I, I got a little cute here, in case you're wondering. I, I, I he played this and I should have just taken there, just continue with the lockout, keep all the pawns nice and solid. I played a little frisky by playing this. Uh, it's a little more complicated, it's still winning. Um, he can actually sort of win this pawn, which in a way it looks like he just broke out of my lockout position. Um, but I'm, I'm hitting this rook, so he can't take with the bishop, otherwise he'd lose. So he's got to take it that way. But unfortunately, this tactic just wins. So I saw this, you know, moves ago. And so this is why it's not really relevant to look through all this. It's just, this just wins. There's some cute little tactics here, which I don't want to waste too much time with, but this is just a winning end game. So this is the long end of the game, but um, uh, the, the point really, it was won much earlier when I, Found a way to lock his bishop out. Okay, next is Lamsley. Where's Lamsley? Okay, this has got two lockouts here. I'm black again. All right. This is just kind of a funky opening. Pay no attention to this crazy opening. Here I threaten checkmate, queen h4 checkmate. So he's trying to lock me out, actually. If I didn't have this tactic and I came back here, he just locked me out. So I don't want to fall for that. Okay, I'm falling for that. Too, too early in the game. I played that. Now he can't lock me out because I got this square covered. We're just developing our pieces, getting our guys out.
How did you take the night? Why did I take the night? I took the night because um, when he goes here, he's threatening knight to e5. And this guy's pinned. Uh -huh. It was very annoying. Good question. Now it's just much simpler. I can castle easily. I got to find position. Okay. Question number one. What's the best piece on the board right now? Right. My knight? Well, that's very kind of you. I like yeah. that knight too. But I, and it's pretty good. I agree. But there's another piece that's currently probably a little bit better. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> dark bishop. We're right. Yeah. Exactly. That dark bishop is great. In fact, that's the whole point of his whole opening with this whole pawn chain, you know, and the bishop here is, is just controlling all these dark squares in the middle of the board. But his bishop is fantastic. Uh, so I can't have that. I can't have him having such a prize bishop. So what do I play? Okay, it's a form of the lockout. It's blocking him down, making that bishop look a lot more stunted, and also giving my knight an extra square to jump into. Um, there's some tactics involved here, but again, it's principle I want to focus on. So it comes in here, I jump in. Okay, now this. So this is a very interesting position because actually he can win this knight with his bishop, but it takes him some time to do so. And during the time which he's do taking to take that knight, I can proceed with a brunt force attack in the middle of the board, which is what happens. So I've kind of locked his bishop out and he's compelled to waste time to take it, which is exactly what I want, in which case I get more time to attack him. But notice he can't really get his knight to a good square. It's kind of locked out of the game a little bit. Can't go to this square because then I get a check, mm -hmm. fork. So he's really compelled to waste more time, which is always good for me. So he does that, I do that. He takes and he wins a pawn. But at what cost? All right, so now I just get to build up all my pressure. He's not going to be able to take this pawn because I'm going to come in here and check him all the way down on this D1 square. Um, and my bishop's about to come out and check him. So he's in a pretty uncomfortable position here. He is compelled to come into the center uh, with his king to defend that guy. So I take. And I play this cute little move, which is a distraction, trying to pull his queen away from the defense of this square where I'll come crashing in and checkmate him. So he doesn't take that, he just retreats. And now here's lockout number two. I should have asked you guys, dang it. Sorry, sorry, fellas. There's lockout number three. Okay, he really wants to develop these guys, doesn't he? But he can't. King's stuck in the middle. I've got really nice development with almost all of my pieces, just not the rook. And um, his pieces are just absolutely pathetic. So b4 is really the, the beauty move in this game. Uh, it's so easy to miss. I could play a lot of different things right now. But if I let his other guys get out, it's very likely he could defend this because I'm not actually up any material. So b4 is great. He really tries to break it down, get his guys out, but he has no time. So the fork on his rook, and a fork in here. Coming in, coming in. And see, this is a really sadistic move. I could just take his rook and you can take my bishop, but there's no need. Uh, I can just play this, which now I'm hitting both of his rooks and I get to save my nice piece. So, I mean, the end of the game is sort of irrelevant. He's already lost tons of material. His king is a disaster. Interestingly enough, the, the one undeveloped piece I have right now is now active because it's behind a pass pawn. Um, so this is just... This is just the end of the game.
in case you're interested. Um, but the key key moments that won me that game were the lockout of his b2 bishop here and a nice little b4 move here, which bought me just enough time to blast him. Okay, Anthony says, where did he go wrong? Which move could have prevented this tragedy? <laughs> that's, that's funny. Thanks for <laughs> calling it the tragedy. Um, that's a good question. Um, I suspect that um, Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's, it's, how about no trickery in the beginning of the game and develop pieces? That would be a good start. Um, yeah, he, I don't think he's lost here. This is just kind of a bad. This is a bad move because when I let's say he plays something, knight c three. Now, if I play here and try to lock that guy out, he is not compelled to give me all these squares, he could come back like this. Maybe he can survive this. And see, but this is different because now if I, now my knight doesn't have this square. Oops, sorry guys. Um, in the game, when he does that, suddenly this square is super weak and allows my knight to enter. So, that was the beginning of the end, let's say, uh, when he pushed d3, which it looks like a kind of natural move, but it weakens this square and really lets me to block out his bishop and get my knight in the game. So he could play, he could play knight a3, just as an example. He's not dying here. He's not a great position, but he's not dying here either. Okay, good question. Okay, we all like attacks. Actually, we've seen a couple attacks here, but on a specific theme. So now let's talk about what are the necessary ingredients for an attack. Uh, in this case, where I had my successful attack, I won and was successful because right here, how many pieces are attacking his king? One, two, three. Maybe a little bit of help from the pawn. That's about it. How many pieces does he have defending? One and some pawns. But the pawns are not on dark squares, so his dark squares are very weak. So that's what's called a local force majority. It's a key term in chess, local force majority. If you have more guys in the vicinity of their king, you have a local force majority and you're very likely to have a successful attack. If you don't, it doesn't matter how good you are, it's not gonna be successful. And so the next few games we'll be looking at how to develop and how to sense when you have a local force majority or how do you create a local force majority so that you can have a successful attack. You still gotta find the checkmate move. You still gotta find the good uh, preparation moves. But if you don't have the guys in the area it's not going to work. Have anybody heard this term local force majority or, or heard, heard it used before? Okay, this is a nice one. This is just a fun game, but also a, a nice local for, force majority. Okay, I'm white here against Bob Atwell. Um, so I've got a lot of really nice games against. There's something about him. I always always had his number. So this is a Petrov opening. Uh, it's kind of a weird move, but basically it just opens up my pieces easily. It accepts a double pawn, but I get easy easy development. Okay. Let me let me pause here. I, I played this. Where is he going to castle? I have no idea. He could go either way. He could play his queen up and castle that way. He could castle that way. So I don't want to. I don't want to decide where I'm going yet. Okay. If I assumed he was going to castle kingside, I could play something crazy. I could play h4. I could play h3, and then g4. 
I could um, play knight g5. I, I could do all kinds of stuff over here, but he may not be going over there. So don't do that. Prepare in other ways until you know where the king is. Knight e4, bringing him into the center. He's a little bit closer to everywhere. Okay, he plays knight d5. Not a good move. He's not castled yet. <clears throat> still, I still don't know where he's going. But actually, I have a cute little tactic here. This is not the point of the game. The point of the game is the local force majority. But this is this is kind of a cute tactic. Um, can anyone see just uh, for fun why he can't just block me with pawn to c6? What's the problem with that move? Uh, knight to what is it? F6. Oh, I'm sorry, c6. Uh, and then he captures with the bishop. Yep. Boom. Yep. Boom. Win, win back your piece. Dominating position. He's toast. Very good. So we can't do that. So he's got to go back. So now he's retreating. And now I got another cute tactic. Again, not, not the point of the discussion, but this is a really kind of beautiful geometric move here. All my guys are kind of splaying out to him. Uh, can't take the knight because it's pinned. It's a fork on multiple things. I'm hitting this knight in the center now. It's undefended. That was, that's why that was a bad move. It's hitting the g7 pawn over here, which is a check. It's hitting the bishop in the middle. Very uncomfortable position. There's a lot of options here. I'm not going to go through them all. He takes here. I took here. This is the, this is the cute move. <laughs> Uh, I could do other things too. Takes there. Doesn't look that bad actually. If I take with the queen, uh, he's a piece up. So I play this move, <laughs> the sadistic move, uh, forcing him to basically run. He, he, he better run. So he runs. <laughs> and I check him. And he runs again. And now here's where the local force majority comes in. So my knight is all up in his grill. I've got great development, totally developed. And I've also got the opportunity to do a, a rover, which is a rook lift and over, because he's got an undefended piece here on b5, which I can get a tempo on. So how do I do that? How, where's the rook lift? Who sees the rook lift in theory, you know, materializing? Where are we gonna go? D5. Rook to d5. And then rook over somewhere useful, right? Over towards the king. Right. You got it. OK, this is a local force majority. Bishops in no man's land. Queen is kind of over there, but she's cut off by the knight. Rook's nowhere near. So this guy's a defender. This rook is his only, well, his pawns are defenders too, OK? So he's got some pawns and a rook, and that's it. Meanwhile, I've got, oops, I've got knight, rook, queen's coming. So I got three versus one piece, three pieces versus one piece. That's a local force majority. Usually you need two more. So in other words, if you have three attackers and they got one, you got a good shot. If they have two defenders, you're gonna probably need four. So if, you only, if you're coming at me with only two attackers and I got one or two defenders, it's really not going to work unless I really screw up. You got to have a majority. And the end is just a cool example of that. You know, anybody see my threat? Actually, I just played rook. Uh, oops, hold on. That's not the move. I just played rook h. How do I clear this stuff? Here we go. Yeah. I don't know how to clear these things. I got to click on them again. Okay. So I got my rook over to h5. What's the threat? White to move. Queen up one. Close. Rook h7, queen h3, checkmate. You got it. Queen, eight, queen eight, e4. Uh, let me just make a dumb move here. This is a fine move. It wins a piece, but it doesn't win the game. Um, it's, a th it's a fork on the bishop and a checkmate, but I can, I can block checkmate. Forcing option is, is uh, what Matt said. Good job, Matt. 
Uh, this is a classic side knight checkmate. I don't know if it has a better term than that, but it's check, checkmate. Um, this is kind of a classic motif. Uh, we all know about back rank checkmates where you've got the three pawns that are blocking you from coming up and you bring something to the back rank and check them. And this is the, the side knight uh, checkmate, which is also kind of a classic. The knight blocks these two and then the pawn blocks the other one. So that's, uh, that's the threat when I bring my rook over there. So he has to block it with something. So what does he do? Hold on here. Okay, so he plays g6, pawn to g6, thinking I'm going to have a little bit of time here. That rook's going to have to retreat, and then I can try to run or something, but he ain't going anywhere. There's a nice ending here. I'll just wait a minute in case anyone happens to spot it, uh, and then we'll, we'll keep moving on because, again, it's not about tactics. This is just a fun one. Mate and two. Aha, good job, Zach. Queen H6 threatens checkmate. I don't have to move that rook because if you take me, if she does, I just checkmate you there. Very good. Uh, it's the only check on this diagonal that works because otherwise he could block it with his own power <coughs> checked on the on the other squares, so I had to had to get to that particular square. Good job. Local force majority worked like a charm. Next, local force majority. Um, okay, in this one, this is this is a classic. Uh, Mel, you know this game. This is a classic uh, Franklin Chen Carl game, where. I was able to manufacture a local force majority, even though he still had a lot of pieces on the board. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna zip through this a little bit. This is a Dutch opening. This is a very complicated opening. Can I interject very quickly? Sorry. So I was um, actually playing in the same tournament uh, Tuesday night, and honestly, my game was quite mundane uh, in one of the neighboring boards and. Not only I start watching Kevin playing Franklin, it became extremely exciting um, to a point where I stopped caring about my game and, and I just thought about Kevin. <laughs> What's that? And you Did lost because of it. It's my fault. Probably. <laughs> but it was worth it. Thanks. Yeah, this was a this was a fun one. This was this was like a game that you know, you, you, it's for the spectators. You know, you're glad there's other people around because you don't get to play moves like this very much. But anyway, it started as a kind of a weird Dutch opening. We're getting our guys out. Again, I'm not gonna, this is not the point of the lecture. I'm gonna get to the necessary bits here. Uh, let's see, we got a comment. Lawrence Jones with the background noise. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. If you can mute, or maybe I can mute you. Yeah, I can mute him, I think. There we go. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, okay. All right, nothing too too wild here, right? We just got our guys out. We're equal material, both castled. Bringing people to the middle of the board. Get my king safe. This bishop is sort of rerouting itself. It's, it's really kind of bad here, so I'd like to reroute it over to the side where I can pin his knight. It's a kind of common motif in this opening. There it goes. Okay, here we go. Now, I don't have a particularly good position here. It's even-ish. He's got a great rook file. Pressure on this knight. If he has time, if I just diddle around, he's gonna push that pawn to b5 and I'm gonna lose because he's gonna win all these pawns over here. This bishop is staring right through the middle of the board at some nice juicy targets. His king looks very safe. This looks like a very classic crush position for white, a slow positional crushing position. Just get your rooks to the C file, push the pawn, kick that knight out of the way, and win all my guys. So as you can tell, you know, Franklin's no idiot. 
I'm sitting here as black, I'm sweating a little bit. You know, if I don't get something going, he's going to just destroy me. So, so how do I get something going? Uh, well, I started with this move. <laughs> um, this is a move that has a couple purposes. Uh, not an easy move to find either because it obviously can be taken. Um, but it can really only be taken with one guy in a very logical way. If he took it with this guy, then it, it's a little shaky because this pawn in the middle is, is now um, uh, uncovered. So this is still good for this is still good for him, but you know I could play something like I'm not sure what's better, probably this, um, and no, well, <coughs> I've freed my position a little bit. He can't he can't win this pawn on c7 right away because I'll win bishop. If he runs the bishop away, I can reinforce it. You know, if he comes back here, I can just do something like that. So I've, I've really kind of freed up my position a lot. And so he doesn't want to let me do that. Instead, I, which I expected he would, he would play this move, which also looks solid, but now that his king is a little bit open. And, but I have no way to get in there. I mean, I don't have a local force majority here. I got a bishop and a queen against a knight and a bishop. That's not going to cut it. Two against two is not going to work almost always. Um, but I noticed something, actually I noticed the last move, but uh, I noticed it here too. His pieces cannot get over to the king side. They're blocked by his own pawns. His queen cannot get over there, the rook can't easily in this rook. And so really, I'm only dealing with the king and the bishop and the knight. So if I can find a way to get some more guys over there, I got a chance. So I'll play next move is another pawn sacrifice. Uh, pawn to g5, and um, so this is basically to get my rook into the game. You got to have open files if you want the rooks in the game. And uh, it also has a devilish trap, um, but basically it's a positional move as well to try to get more guys in the game. It's um, to, to establish a local force majority so they have a chance to checkmate him. Now, in this case, he took, which is unfortunately a blunder for him because I have a really cool move here, which I'm not going to ask you to find because it's really compli complicated, but it's this move, uh, which is take his knight. Now he's got one less defended piece. Of course, he wins my queen, but now I got rook g1, uh, rook to g8. And at this point in time, he's losing that bishop, which means now I've gotten his knight, and I've gotten his bishop, and I've cleared away his pawns. So he's got zero defenders. And I lost my queen in the process. That's true. But I still have bishop and rook. And actually, the other one's coming in really soon. So I got three against zero. Cannot get his guys over fast enough. The tactics work out. But essentially, the key is, in the span of several moves, I went from two attackers, queen and bishop, against two defenders, knight and bishop, and come some pawns. The span of a couple moves. Now he's got no defenders and I've got three attackers. And the end is checkmate. That's a fun one. <laughs> Beautiful. Sorry, Frank, I'm glad you're not here to see that. He, he, <laughs> not good memory. I've, I've, I've had bad, bad ends in my game like this too, but uh, he was a good sport. And um, unfortunately in this, this situation, his king was just completely cut off and, and nobody could come over to help him. Um, thanks, Dan. Yes, that, that was a good one. That's a brutal one. So that's a local force majority. I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and actually show you what happens when, when you try to attack without a local force majority. So this is one of my bad games. So this is a game that I played against Finn, Finn Uberly. Uh, and in this 
game, Finn is, he, he vacillates between 1700 and 1900. He's a very good player, uh, repeat senior champion, real nice guy. But, you know, I've got a rating edge on him. So, of course, I want to beat him every time I play him. Um, and so this game was no different. I was white. And right out of the opening, he played a kind of meatball opening here and just completely gave me the center of the board. So not only do I want to beat him because I outrank him by 400 points, but I really want to beat him because he's playing junk opening too. <laughs> but it just goes to show you, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you have to play what's on the board. Uh, so I just developed my guys here. This is nothing that fancy. Just bringing pieces out. Again, you know, he's making moves like queen e8. What is it? What is this move? This is just goading me. This is like a, the bullfighter is just holding out the, the red cape saying, come, come get me, Carl. And so I, I couldn't resist, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, when you look at this position, this position is not an attacking position. I would like to go and checkmate him. Who wouldn't? Well, who do I have over there? I got a knight and a bishop. And maybe a bishop on d3. Okay, so I got I got these guys. And I'm maybe that pawn. But he's got rook, pawns, bishop, knight, queen. He's got guys. This is not an attack. So if I was smart, if I was not in this game, I would just castle and I would just bring my rooks to the center, and I try to bowl them over in the center. That's it. That's the way you play this position. This is not an attacking position. But here's what happens when I try to attack. OK, I play a bishop back. I'm going to try to get a battery with my queen. He brings it again. He's moving pieces back and forth. He's just he's goading me. So I line up my pieces. Looks good, right? You know what's coming next. I'm going to open up the window here. Pawn e5, checkmate. Problem is, Finn's not an idiot, and he's not going to fall for this. He's got the guys over there. He's got some defensive structure. He's got a much worse position. No question. He's not developed. I really should just castle and play d5. Just push these pieces in the center. But I didn't. He plays this move. I played this move, thinking, all right, I threatened checkmate. Everything's good. You know, I got my pieces pointed over there. Shuts me down. Kind of an annoying move. Blocks my big diagonal. I really want to get over there. If I take him, though, it sort of simplifies the position a little bit. Knight comes back and defends that tender square. I'm not going to checkmate him here. He's much worse still. But this is where I got ahead of myself. Didn't have, didn't really have a local force majority, but I kept trying to push it through. So I didn't, I didn't do that. I played here. Thinking that I really want to open up the files over there. I really want to play h3 g4 something busted busted open in other words thinking he doesn't des he doesn't deserve to play these kind of passive moves you know i should be able to just force it through and beat him but he plays very solid defensive chess trying to open up the h file Trying to get my guys in. I'm trying to get a local force majority, but look at how many guys he has over here. These guys are all defenders. He's got a lot of ammunition. It's not going to work. It doesn't work. There's better moves in here, of course, but I'll just show you kind of what happened here. I was a little worried about my bishop getting trapped over there um, at some point. He's not playing anything spectacular. This was another boneheaded move, F4. What am I doing here? He's repulsed the attack, probably a little, maybe a little, I don't know about better, but even-ish. 
trying to get my rook into the game now. Now he's opening up. Pieces are coming out. All right, that's, that's the big move I missed. This is just absolutely ugly for me now. Where's my attack? Got no attack. His pieces are coming into the game. My king is sitting on E1. <laughs> His knights have great squares. So it's an abysmal position. It's, and it's absolutely no fun either. It's not technically losing. I mean, I could, I could play on here, but this is so demoralizing to be thinking you're attacking someone and to be repulsed and to then have to backtrack and play for equality is incredibly hard psychologically to do. And most people do not, which is why most people, when you repulse their attack, you win. <laughs> so this is what happened here too. Um, Queen E8 has purpose now, says Zach, absolutely. Um, it's like I, you know, even, even, even his rook f7, which looked like such a pathetic move before, is now ready to double up somewhere and protecting his second, his second rank. So, you know, here I just sort of, this is, I don't even want to look at the rest of this. I sacrifice an exchange, two exchanges to try to just make it complicated. Totally lame, didn't work. I'm trying to just drum up something creative, but didn't work at all. He just sort of uh, me mechanically traded down, which I would have done the same. And it's all, I mean, it's over. I'm not looking at the rest of this. Terrible game, okay? So coming back to it. Here, I still have a good position. And I probably should have just played take, take, castle. Rookie one, just play. Or here, same, castle, rookie one, push in the center. Okay. Next. Local force majority again. He defended like a Viking. <laughs> yeah, yes, he did. Um, another local force majority win. And the, this is a good example of wasted moves. All right, so wasted moves um, get throttled. Um, I forget what this guy's rating was. I didn't, didn't punch it in. Not, not very good, I don't think. So, okay, here, just taking a piece for no real purpose, dumb move. Didn't even, didn't even threaten it. I would have happily played h6 to trade this off, but he just took it. Another move? That bishop just moved, didn't it? Not castle. Wasted time. He does it again. So now I got two bishops. Easy development. At least equal. And then he castles into my bishop's view. I'm looking right at him. So how do I how do I proceed with the attack here so I can get a, a local force majority? This king's over there. I'd like to go after him, but the, the conditions are not yet ripe. How do I get more guys over there? Queen move. Clean move. Clean where? I don't know. B. Either B or A. Yeah, so Queen B6 is okay. Not bad. But it's hard to get more of my back guys out if she's there. She's in the way. Maybe start marching some pawns. Queen a5. Queen a5 is an idea. I like queen a5 a little more. Um, and marching pawns is, is the right answer. But it's in combination with queen a5. So I'll give full credit, Daniel, a5. This one comes first, though. 
Um, whenever you have a, a time like this where you're deciding between two moves, in this case, um, maybe b5, queen a5, do the one that you are absolutely sure you want to do first. So I definitely want to do b5. Kick that knight away, because then I got a low force majority. It's not going to be as close of a defender. And also, you know, the queen, I think I want to go to a5, but maybe I'll go somewhere else. So b5 first. There he is. There she is. Threatening something. Threatening the pawn, basically. Because um, it's just a matter of time before I kick that knight away or take that knight and, and come on in with the queen. So he plays this. This is not a good move. When you are trying to defend, you should not be moving pawns in front of your king. Your pawns are strongest when they're a solid united front. When you and, and to, to really get an attack on a king, you need to be able to open lines, usually for more people. In that first game with Atwell, we had the big rook lift, big rook, rook rover to come on over. Didn't need to open a line there because I had an easy access point. But usually you have to have pawns touch each other to open up lines. And right now my pawns are two squares away from his pawn wall. So it's going to take me a little while to get these guys down there to open up some lines. But as soon as he does that, suddenly it's really close. And I can open up a pawn, um, open up a, a file right away. So basically this, this game is essentially over. A grandmaster couldn't save this game. Um, so what's he do? He tries to run away. He's defending. He's got a knight. Who's defending his king? I guess I could say his queen is defending his king. Knight's defending a little bit. But the queen and the rook also are a barrier for the king to run. <laughs> and in this case, there's kind of a fun tactic to uh, play to try to try to get at him. We got our bishop pointed at him. We got a pawn up in the mix. We got a queen. We got a rook ready to come in. So the necessary local force majority is in effect. And so if you get a position like this in your game, you start counting attackers. One, two, three, four. They're pretty close in proximity to the king. They've only got a couple. You should sit on that position as long as it takes to find the winning move, because there very likely is one. Um, and if there's not, bring another guy into the party. Did anyone see the uh, crushing blow here? So it takes pawn. Bishop takes pawn. Woo. I didn't play that. <laughs> Does it work? Let's see. I don't really think so. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So king's got to take. Now what's your follow-up? We're going to do rook or pawn? Pawn takes. Pawn takes. Pawn takes, OK. Now, now where? Oh, we can push, get the another check in here. Where's the king going? King's going probably back to the, uh, yeah, either way. So this is one, oops, this is one of those uh, moments uh, I've used this a few times in my games, and I always find it very aesthetically pleasing when you hide behind your own enemy. <laughs> um, so in this position, if you just sort of play like here. Right. Now the queen moves over on the bay. Yeah, the queen can move over, but um, somewhere. But you can you can kind of you can kind of get over there and defend a little bit now. Queen up to uh, b three, and I mean rook, rook behind the queen first. Yeah. Okay. So rook back. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's pleasant position for me, but I don't think I'm. Well, you do diversion here with the bishop now. Maybe I'll go here. What? Okay. Now queen goes up. Mm. 
This is probably where we have to double the rooks behind the queen. Close. This Very is probably where I think to you here. It's very close. Oh, no, how about um, just queen takes? Queen takes knight, 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 knight. Queen takes knight, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No. Very close. I don't think it's mate, though. I don't know about mate, but does it get us an exchange or get us material up? Not in this case, you're down a queen, but I, I, I love all the attacking moves. It's great if you didn't have anything better. Um, in this case, though, you, you sacrificed a piece without a checkmate on the board. So you're so close. So I played this move first. Same now, now, same kind of stuff, all being threatened, but it's just hanging in the air. If you see the checkmate, you go for it. But if you don't see the checkmate, maybe this is my sadism, you know, you let them suffer. You just add some pressure and usually they'll crack. Even a great player cracks. They do something stupid or they make a bad move because the pressure is too much. So rook b8 can't be a bad move. Um, and uh, just add the pressure little by little. Okay, so he takes. Conditions are ripe. <laughs> Maybe Bishop takes B2 now and King takes b2, rook takes b4, king c1, rook takes b1, king takes b1, rook b8, king c1, queen a1, checkmate. So now we don't have the pawn to hide behind. So it was kind of a favor that he got rid of that pawn, right? Yeah. Now you want to give me some more, get rid of my other defender. So again, we're just trading defenders. You know, I'm getting rid of one of your, your defenders, but I got more in reserve. Whereas you don't have another knife over here. So that's it. That's the end there. Whoop. Good job, Mel. Sharp eye. So this, so again, let me let me refresh something that's a key point. I'm so I hope I'm not belaboring the point, but it's so easy in a game to get into I take you, you take me, I go here, you go here, and you totally forget the idea of the local force majority. You must have enough pieces. So even right here, you know, I've got a lot of pieces. I got a pawn and a queen and a bishop, but he's got a knight and a queen. That's really two pretty good defenders. And he's got the pawns too, but transform it a couple, in a couple moves, I got two attackers and he's got zero. See, because of the way the, structure is set up, he's got no defenders left. And so that, you know, it was a nice little bit of tactics that we used to kind of trade off some of those defenders and replace them with my own attackers. But um, the strategic concept of that, that imbalance around the king is really important. And if you can try to keep those sort of general strategic ideas in mind, you'll know when you can attack and when you can't. You don't need to calculate everything to know when to attack. Sometimes you just need to count to three or count to four and um, try to know who, who are the relevant defenders. Okay, questions on this one? Okay, we've got it. Now we've got a couple examples of um, local, of non local force majorities. So we got people trying to attack, usually me, without a force majority. And we'll see what happens. Let's see, what's this one? 
Okay, I'll start with this one. I'm black. I'm playing Franklin Chan again. I got a bunch from him. There's some good games with him. He is going to try to just brain me in this game. Okay, Let's see what happens. I let him have the center, but I'm going to try and chip away at it. He plays this move, which is actually a good move um, because my bishop's kind of in no man's land out there. It's going to have to retreat. Um, and he loses the right to castle. And I'm just bringing, we're bringing our guys out. I'm going to try to bring my knight to the center, try to eventually um, push in the center with one of my pawns. Okay, here it comes. Franklin wants to kill me. <laughs> and he wants to kill me with his G pawn. He's going to try to open up the G file or the H file so he can use his rook over there. Which is all well and good, but who can tell me what's the problem with this? Why is this not going to work? It shouldn't work. Volunteers. Probably easier to talk it out rather than type this, so feel free to unmute. And... I mean, it's just a bad idea to open up your castle, right? I mean... Okay, his king's more exposed. True. Sometimes it's worth it, though, if you get enough guys in, right? How about in this particular situation? Have I done anything very stupid in this opening? Wait, you, you could argue with that. Maybe maybe this little bishop foray out to b4 and then back and then around. Maybe that's kind of stupid. It probably is. But I haven't done anything too boneheaded. I've got my guys out. You know, I haven't castled yet. I could always go queenside, right? So he, maybe he's attacking me in a place where I'm not actually going to be. So as long as I don't lose my cool, I haven't done anything that stupid. He doesn't have a local force majority, and my king's not even on the king's side yet. It can go anywhere he wants. So it's premature. Bad move. So I hit him in the center. I don't want to waste time moving that guy again. Let's get rid of him. OK, now his bishop's pretty good. And I traded off my dark square bishop. And actually, that pawn is kind of annoying on g5 because it gets in the way of me developing my knights. So I'm just going to lock him out. This is just a strategic concept of, um, you know, putting your pawns on the opposite color of, of the bishop you have. Right now, I've got a light square bishop. Don't have a dark square bishop. So if I get more pawns on dark squares, I can maintain some control on dark square. Um, now here I played sort of a bad move. He's got he's got a tactical idea here, which I'm going to just gloss over. Um, but I played this move, which is really trying to, well, it it it, it uh, looks at the pin on his rook with my bishop, right? So it's kind of looking there. If he takes me on f6, then he then that pawn's moved a bunch of times, and he just helps my knight develop like this. I'm going to castle, probably, and then my rook's looking right at his king. So suddenly his position's looking pretty shaky here, so he doesn't do that. And I knew he wouldn't do that. So it helps me to kind of get some space in the center without really worsening anything. Did you did you feel nervous at all when you were just pushing up that, that F pawn there? That is a really fun move to play. Um, yeah, I mean, if he were nervous for what, just in general, you mean? I mean, it just seems it feels like you're exposing your king there, and yeah, it'd be pretty sure. Yeah, well, actually, I don't want to open things up over here too much, but specifically, I knew that he couldn't open it up. So again, like if he takes here and I take here, I don't know what his next move is. Maybe rook g8. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can just castle. Um, I don't know where, where's his king going. You know, maybe. I'm not sure. It's a little awkward to get his guys over here, and my and my guys are all over there. You know, even if if he just plays some sort of simple stuff, if I just play here, here, look over. I'm just making up kind of weird moves here. 
you know, look at my position. I got rooks doubled on an open file. My knights are close to my king. I've got lots of defenders around him, so there's no way he's going to have a local force majority. Um, my bishop's nice. My knights have squares, so I can go to c5, e6, jump around. So, you know, it's, it's a solid position. Uh, he does have bishop h6, uh, as you indicated, um, Zach, um, here. Um, but, you know, I can just go there anyways and defend. Um, again, a, a two, two, two person attack is not going to beat me. I got enough guys over here. Um, eventually, he's going to have to run away. And uh, he'll just have wasted a move. So F5, it's a very non-traditional move, F5. He could also check me here. But I got a blocker. And then I went upon. So um, there's some, some ideas for um, kind of pushing him back as well. So what did he play? He played Rook G. And I blocked him out. And this was the position I was shooting for when I played F5. And you know, this is just a really pleasant position for me. I can get my guys out easily. Um, I, I got a nice solid dark square pawn chain, which is good because it accentuates my light square bishop. Um, he's got a pawn and a rook attacking my king side, and that's it. The other guys can't really get over there. He moves his knight to d5. I'll just hack it off. And his king's stuck in a weird place. My king can kind of go anywhere he wants um, if he feels the danger looming. So I bring my knight out, bring the queen out. Just looking at these sort of tender light squares, queen h3 check. Maybe I'm going to castle queen side. He wants to trade. He's scared. That's good. I want to trade too because I got a great end game. The point is, like, I don't, I don't necessarily need I'll go through the whole rest of the game here, but the point is his attack didn't do anything. Because I kept my cool, I knew in my head that shouldn't work. And actually, that's that's key. Let me let me pause on that question, uh, that point for a second. It's been said that if you took an average grandmaster, that was 2,600, 2,700, great player. And if you allowed them to look at stockfish once, maybe twice per game, their rating would go up 100 points. <clears throat> and the reason why I think that is, is because it gives you certainty. When you can have that moment where you're uncertain, you're not sure, am I better? Am I worse? Is there a win? Is there not? And if you can just get an evaluation that one time, it's hugely helpful because it changes how you play. You know, if I tell you, if I show you a position, I say black to move and win, you probably will find it, or at least you'll, you'll look hard and you're likely to find it. But in the middle of the game, nobody tells you that. Nobody says, you got a winning move here. You have to sense it. And that's much harder. But in these kind of attacking positions where you're attacking or someone's attacking you, if someone's attacking you with only two pieces, and you got two or three defenders, you should know that's not going to work. Black to play and win. Black to play and repulse this attack. And you got to look for it. And if you have that confidence, to, to know that this shouldn't work, you're much more likely to find good moves. So in this case, you know, the attack's over. In fact, he bailed out with a queen trade, which is fine with me. Um, I'll just kind of show you a few more moves here, but the attack's way over and I just kind of ground him down in a really very comfortable end game for me. This is- Sorry, just to add a quick point. Yeah. Uh, I was reading this book, Jazz of Physics, and there's this saxophone player. He made a, a similar comment about confidence and how possibilities open up. Uh, as, you, as you said, Lou, you know, taking a glance at the stockfish evaluation and you know, playing confidently and finding all the moves, right? So he said, the more confident I am with the next note I'm gonna play on my sax, the more possibilities open up. I thought it's relatable. That's a great comment, yep. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned, I think I'm a psychiatrist too, and then optimism plays a role in that, and people make their own good luck when they look for good things and when they assume good things will happen. So, um, 
So anyways, I play another kind of cute move here. This is a, a very untraditional move, but um, but a really good one and, and allows me to activate my rook. And anyways, his, his bishops just are really ineffective and my pieces are very effective. And he, um, he has a cute little tactic here that he thought would uh, win and it, it almost won, but not quite <laughs> because um, if I had to retake that rook, or if I had to retake that knight right now, then he would have some activity uh, and take my pawn on d6, but I can just do this. And, and then this is just a very easily winning end game. So I'll show you the ending in case you're interested. Um, lock that bishop out. There's another lockout here. I'm just going to run around and win that bishop. See? Do, 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 do. Win that bishop. And then this is an easy, easy bishop end game. I just come around and take that pawn and and uh, win with d2. Okay, so that's that one. The attack did not work, premature. I'll just kind of run through the relevant points there one more time. Okay, no local force majority. I'm not even castled. If I was castled, I would say it's a different position. Maybe then rook g1 and, and g4 would be effective. But when I'm not even castled, I'm not stuck over there, it's premature. Punch him in the center. Look for good moves. So I'm curious. Uh, you took over with f4, right? Um, is it too outrageous to just take on f5 here and something like bishop takes h1, queen h5 check, and uh, yeah, I was hoping to trap the bishop, you know, lock it out with f3 and king f2. Uh, I don't know if I have enough time, but my d5. It's a good point. It's great to look for these queen checks, especially when you have anything else over there. Um, um, in this case, um, I'm I'm suspicious uh, because of the topic of this lecture. You know, you you basically you've got queen and two pawns. That's good, and you've got probably one bishop, although he's he could be more effective. It's just hard to see how exactly he's going to attack my king. And the rook is going to take a number of moves to get in there. I've got a couple of guys here on my king. Two knights, rook, queens, easily accessible. It's it's interesting. You know, this bishop is very important here. If you can if you can lock him out, I'd say maybe because then you can get the knight into d5. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. F3. Yeah. It's slow though, so you're probably right that black should be able to defend somehow. My idea was just to keep the pawns on g5 and f5 and just, you know, uh, your rook's out of play too, right, on h8 and... Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good thought. Uh, it's, it's certainly uncomfortable for me, um, especially after I lose that bishop, then it's, uh, it's a little tricky. Maybe I can counterattack a little bit. Give you some something to sweat about. Yeah. Um, Bishop C two, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oop, no, not that move. How about? Yeah, trade queen. Mm -hmm. Get him out of there. <laughs> suspicious, but I'm trying to distract you from F3 as well. Yeah, uh, that's a good move. You know, if you... So you probably have to retreat. You don't want to push here and give me this nice square. Right, that doesn't work. Queen G4, maybe. So probably Queen G4, yeah. And then maybe... Um... I'll just develop. What about h4? Or I mean h6. h5. See what happens there. Yeah. Not crazy. Not crazy. I think you want to keep these pawns here as long as possible to keep my knight from really entering the game. 
And so that's that's not a bad move. You know, if you play here, then you kind of give me give me some squares, knight f6 and whatnot. It, it's certainly uncomfortable. Um, it's a good idea. This is what you would have played, I'm sure, Mel. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, you take over otherwise. Yeah. It's one of those positions where, um, let me just kind of make a teaching point. Um, in a position like this, sorry for all the arrows. I don't know how to get rid of them. Um, in, a, in a position like this where you feel like I'm on the verge of just getting crushed, it's good to complicate things <laughs> because when things are complicated, people make mistakes. And so, you know, that, that general idea that Mel brought up, which is to sacrifice, in this case, a whole rook, but maybe later it will turn into an exchange if, you know, we get some kind of, um, some kind of position like this. So you're an exchange down, but you have a lot of pressure. It's very complicated. Um, you probably have better chances here than just a strategic slow crush. Very good uh, kind of strategic point. Uh, okay, let's do let's do another one here. Where is it? I want to say thank you. I have to disappear. I'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining. Okay, here's another attack by Franklin Chen. All right, we got a Sicilian. Pretty standard stuff if people are familiar with the Sicilian. Notice I didn't castle yet. Don't keep them guessing, although it's not that not that hard to guess where my king's going at this point. Um, so he's bringing it. He's bringing his guys over. He's got a rook and a queen and a knight and some pawns looking over there at my king. But what do I have? I got some knights. I got a bishop. I got a rook. So I'm not in panic mode yet. This move is specifically to make room for other pieces. This is a common um, setup in this uh, defense. But uh, essentially, it's to make a little bit of space for my bishop to come back and defend, which is a really important maneuver. OK, here he comes. Space invaders coming at me. Here they come. All right, let me take a, take a moment and just kind of stop for a second. OK, this is pretty scary, right? You got a master that's coming at you, four pawns. And actually, right now, um, does he have a majority? It's, uh, it's hard to say, you know, he's got a lot of guys pointed at me, but they're just pawns and I got pawns in front of my guy too. So he doesn't have that many pieces over there. That's the trick of this, this position. He, he has pawns that are scary looking. And if I panic and if I open up some lines for him, his rook's going to come in fast. But if I don't panic, it's actually hard to open up lines. So my goal here is to keep the keep the majority on balance for me, to not let him get more guys at me, and to try to not open up any lines. So I played this move to just sort of just defend. That's a very important defensive move. He plays here to prevent my knight from jumping into c4 up here. Not playing that. Okay, here we go. So he's dinking around on the side. Generally, the antidote to a side attack is punch him in the center. So that's what I did. This involves a sort of a pawn sacrifice, but basically I'm trying to blast open the center so that he never has any time to get his, his army over there. Um, what was I going to say? Um, by the way, this b3 move does sort of threaten the, the move a5, which is a pretty uncomfortable move because then I, my knight has to grovel in the corner. So in this position, basically, when he played b3, he really forces me to do something aggressive because uh, there's no way I'm playing knight a8. So hit him. Hit him again. Trade. 
Now I got a good square to bring my knight. Okay, he hits me again. I could play a couple of different interesting moves here, but um, okay, here they come again. All right, so let me take another pause. It's just a complicated position. He's not winning. I'm not winning. But the key is to not lose your cool. All right, who's, who's, who's not muted? Lawrence, I'm muting you again. Um, don't panic. He, he doesn't have a local force majority yet because his pawns are in the way. If he opens up some lines, he's going to have a local force majority. His pawns are actually in the way of him. If he can find any way to open up a line, I'm in trouble. My goal is to prevent that. So when he pushed this move, f5, he's trying to push something like g6 or f6 or something. Maybe even, let me make a dumb move here. And maybe even something like this, you know, where suddenly, I'm not saying this is a good move, but it's just a brute force way of opening up lines, which I would have to be very careful of. Um, so I'm trying to trade pieces, simplify the position, and prevent. See that, that, that knight, this is the most likely candidate for sacrificing himself and trying to kill me. So I'm going to try and trade him off ASAP. Tries to open up the F file, which makes sense. But that's why I played my bishop back. In this position, if my bishop was still on this square, I would be dead meat because hopefully you guys see that. If my bishop was here and he pushes this pawn, I don't have the luxury of playing g6 because he's going to take my bishop, right? But if there's nobody there to attack, then I can do the push pass. That's why that move is very important. So it's just a pattern I knew from before. But um, the idea is not give him opportunity to open up lines. So that's why it's important that bishop was out of the range of that f6 move. All right, I'm trading guys. Trading guys. Pushing pawns. Now, where's his local force majority now? He doesn't even have a single piece over there. His pawns are in the way. He's got no open lines. He doesn't have, his pieces are okay. They're not necessarily bad looking, but he's got no attack because it was premature. He didn't have the guys to follow through. And um, he's totally overextended and look at his king. So now role reversal. Yeah. All right, so now my guys are more active. I've got more space. His king is exposed. So that's a pretty good um, scenario for my own type of attack. So now here comes my little one space invader. Um, Getting ready to double up rooks, looking over there at that knight and that juicy pawn in front of the king. Coming in. Coming in. Now I got three guys attacking him, plus the pawn. That's really four. How many defenders does he have? Maybe the knight and the queen. That's about it. Nobody can survive this. Now it's just, it's just tactics now, it's just lost. But he, he resigned here. So the turnaround, you know, it's like the, the, the Kung Fu Jiu Jitsu move here. You know, he's coming at you. Instead of hitting him in the fist, you back up. See, that's the Kung, see that? That's the Kung Fu maneuver. He's coming at me. I back up and he punches at air. All right. So he, he didn't hit me. I just backed up and now he's overextended and now I punch him back. Okay. And as he, he continues to sort of whiff and punch at me, but he doesn't have the power behind it. He doesn't have his guys because he didn't get his guys over there far enough to really have any, any power behind it. All right. Let me see if I got other, other uh, good examples of this. I think I got one more. 
Okay, let's vote. Do we want to have another misguided attack? Or do we just want a fun tactical ending? <laughs> uh, vote in the chat. And we got one more game. Uh, we'll kind of wrap it up and we could, I could answer questions or we could talk about any of the fun positions. Okay, Mark says fun tactical. Let's see who else wants to vote. Wacky tacky. Okay. All right, let's do it. Enough of the local force majority. Okay, do you want to be on the losing side or the winning side? Let's do the winning side. Okay, so this is just a fun attack. Um, probably some lessons to be learned from here, but really well, let's just enjoy it and we'll look at a couple of cool tactics. I'll take a I'll pause a few places and maybe ask you what uh, you might play. This is a Benoni opening. You know, black gives up the center a little bit, but in exchange for a beautiful bishop on g7 and control the center through there and through the e file. Um, tries to expand on the queen side. I restrict him. Nothing that wacky or tack tacky yet. Okay, so I saved my bishop. His knight's sitting there, very likely to be pushed back with my own pawn storm soon. He, he kind of made a mistake by letting my bishop and queen get this battery here because now he can't really get rid of it easily. So it's a bit uncomfortable for him. Not losing though, just, just uncomfortable. So he steps out of the pin, push him back. All right. Now what? Let's think. What do you guys play here? A lot of options for developing, bringing more guys around. If, if you had this position, what would you want to play? <laughs> Even if it didn't quite work. Yeah, you definitely want to play e5, pawn up to e5. You want to blast this guy off the board, right? And in fact, that's what I played, and it works because of several things. Number one, when I take, if, if I push e5, which I do, there, if he takes me and I take back, it looks like his queen can take, but I have some, I have an intermediate move. Also, when he takes this pawn, it also opens up my F file, which is going to be very uncomfortable for him. So in a lot of times, these types of positions, uh, sometimes the best move is really moving the knight, which seems kind of kooky that, you know, you back up and just give me this enormous pawn center. And Funny. nevertheless, a lot of times that's the right strategy because it's very hard to maintain it. You know, if I if I were to play something like this and this, suddenly your bishop's good again, your knights are back in the center, you get your rook out, everything looks hunky dory. Um, and and it's very hard to maintain this pawn structure because now his bishop's attacking it, and he's got extra control over D6. What is the obsidian league player? <laughs> Um, so in, in many cases, this is kind of the right strategy if you get hit in the center in this kind of opening. Um, in this case, it doesn't quite work though for, for, for one reason. Does anyone see what I could play here? Okay, a couple options maybe. A couple juicy options. Be hard to pick. Looks like a trapped rook. Could be a trapped rook. Boom. Yep, that's a trapped rook. Uh, so that's that's the most obvious and most straightforward, I think. Um, just take that guy. 
Um, this would be another tempting option, uh, I think, because similar to before, I really want you to open up some lines for me. You know, when we were here, I wanted you to open up my F file by taking that guy, but you didn't oblige me. So I'll go here, I'll go here. And then if you take me now, suddenly I got the D square here. So I, I got, you know, room to jump that knight in the center now, whereas I didn't before. So same idea of kind of clearance sacrifice to kind of open up some lines. That looks juicy. Um, this is, you could just sit on it too, honestly. You could just play rook somewhere. Um, maybe double up rooks on the F file. Not very direct, though. I'd probably play bishop e7. You know, and you could even sort of play something like this. This looks pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> Open up the F file. Don't let him, you know, let, leave that pawn on e5. It, all it's doing is getting in the way of his bishop and knight. Um, this looks pretty fun as well, but he didn't play that. He played takes, and now what would you play here now to make e5 really pack a punch? Uh, as I said, if you take with the pawn, he could maybe weasel out with queen takes pawn. Well, I have a nice intermediate move before I take that guy. Hit him. Can't cover e5 when there's a pawn in your face. So push the queen. Got a lot of squares to go to. He goes there. Now I can take it. And now this is very uncomfortable because, again, if he takes that pawn on e5 with the knight, well, you know, you just kind of lost that F6 piece. So that's not going to be very good. And so he runs. And I could play the same thing Mark suggested here, Bishop in. But I thought I'd play something a little more <laughs> sadistic. Again, get your guys in. And now I played this move. So I could have I could have played Bishop e7, um, which would have won an exchange, but it also loses that pawn on e5 if I win that exchange. So for instance, here, here, here. Doesn't look good, but. Anyways, he, he's got a little bit of defense around his king now. Bishop's active again. Um, may, maybe not so easy to have me finish him off. So I played this move, which um, is another nice example of cutting a piece off, actually, to come full circle at the beginning of the lecture. But this position is really just completely hopeless for him. Um, it's, one of, it's one of these things I had trouble with earlier in my chess career is, is making moves that didn't win material, but that just completely stuffed the opponent. And this is one of those positions. I'm not, I'm not really material up. In fact, it's even. But his bishop is absolutely awful. I got open lines for my bishop. His pieces look bad. I got a pass pawn. It's just, it's just so winning. Back then, I wouldn't trust that this was so winning because I didn't see a concrete win. But you got to trust... Um, Got to learn to trust. Look at, look, at, look at my move here, king h1. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You can play anything, and this position wins itself. You just get your guys out. Not much he's going to do. I'm going to sink a piece on e7 if he's not careful. Drop a rook all the way down there with those pawns, and that's going to be very uncomfortable. So he tries to block it. Okay, here's a good opportunity to play a good move. Any any guesses from the, the gallery? Uh, good strong move here. You don't have to see see the whole thing, but um, there's a lot of back rank tactics going on here. That king is very uncomfortable, so that's the key to the position: is some back rank tactics um, and some open lines.
All right, in the interest of time, um, I'm sure we would find it if we gave you time, but I'll just, just show you, it's, it's just pushing. If the rook runs away, I just win the knight. The rook's got no squares up here. So you gotta take that pawn, you gotta take it with something. If he takes it with the knight, what do we have? Well, we could we could actually do several things here, but uh, at, at minimum you could play this. Which wins a piece. You could also get a little cuter than that if you want. You could probably take the knight with the queen too. Um, he took with the rook, which is the same kind of motif. So I just took him. And it's pin, which he has to oblige. And he does turtle up. Looks like he's getting out. Not quite. Is that uh, that kind of closes the door on that whole party? <laughs> so unfortunately that's checkmate. So nice little queen sack at the end to, to get some checkmate here. Um, this is another kind of motif where the king's hemmed in by the pawns. Uh, so um, queen a8, queen a7 is looking great, that's right. <laughs> um, so the, just to, to sort of summarize from today, um, there was a couple of motifs I tried to pick some good examples of. One was the lockout which we had a nice example of here at the end, which I didn't even realize, as well as some other lockouts, with pawn, usually with pawn structures, kind of pushing those pieces into the corner if you ever see an opportunity to do that. Uh, it's really satisfying to try it. Um, and then the others are really about attacks and when you can attack and when you can't, and really try to listen to those local force majorities or try to create those local force majorities uh, to have successful attacks. Or if you're on the defending side, this is why they say defenders trade pieces, because if you trade a piece, it's less likely you're going to get clubbed over the head with it. And uh, there was a few examples of that where trading pieces that were coming at you um, helped to minimize the impact of the attack. Uh, so do the, do the counting, look for those strategic uh, opportunities in your games, and obviously practice tactics too. Um, but uh, I hope that those kind of strategies will help you guys. We've got a little time left. I'm happy to chat uh, or stay over if anyone wants to hang on and ask questions about me or, you know, getting better or any kind of uh, general advice. And uh, thanks for everyone's attention and participation. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all for coming. And keep supporting the Pittsburgh Chess Club because we're lucky to have it. Right, Mark? That's right. <laughs> we are. It's true. Thanks, Kevin. This was awesome. Thanks, Mel. You, you, you bet. No, no melee games. I couldn't find any games where I beat you. So. I was hoping you'd reciprocate. There's like 10 games you beat me at least, if not more. I got the big database here. We can always look through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have another, like I showed a few um, in my lesson, but you know, it's totally up to you. Yeah, wow. Well, you showed, so I showed a, a bunch of um, games between you and I and Franklin, and you showed a bunch of Franklin. So. Yeah. I remember there was one where you, you violated all the rules. <laughs> That's every single game. No. <laughs> I'm going to close this uh, chat here. Uh, where's that one? I think it was this one. You, you violated some rules here, Mel. This was a uh -oh. bank of gambit. Remember this one? Oh yeah, this is a very sharp line that I didn't know and I got absolutely crushed. Yeah, this, this is just a very weird kind of pawn structure game. Um, 
and I just really got all my guys out really easily, and, and you have great difficulty getting your guys out. Um, yeah, this wasn't very nice. I remember yeah. looking at this game, and I think this has been played until move 13 or 14 or so. And Oh, really? Yeah, it is playable for Black, but you really have to know what you're doing, and there was a very difficult move Black has to know. Mm -hmm. I already am lost, I think, but yeah, uh, I forgot what it was. Here, I think, especially with this move, you know, which just kind of wants to trade down everything. It's just mm -hmm. no fun. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Wait, how does that work? Oh, bishop b5, yeah, nice. Just a way to trade down. Actually, I'm not sure that was best because you win the pawn back, but it's just. Uh, yeah, why not? It's yeah, very practical. That's, that's the name of the game when you play Mal. Play practical. Don't let him club you. Uh oh. You're giving away all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is. Oh, what's that? Knight C2. That's a fork. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very clever move, actually. If I, if I take him, then you. No, nah, it's a joke. Yeah, you get your, oops, you get your guy back. Yeah, that wins too. But I think uh, this just wins. Okay, that's the only one I could find where I beat you. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I beat, uh, I won all the other games. <laughs> yeah, you did win a lot of games. You did. Uh -huh. All right, any, any other kind of comments or questions about chess or um, getting better or anything like that? <laughs> Would Fisher have beaten Karpov? <laughs> um, Probably, if he didn't go nuts. Yeah, fun fact, Fisher probably had severe bipolar disorder coming from a psychiatrist, kind of interesting chess, chess bit. Um, he was markedly delusional, manic preoccupation with things, had very clear psychosis regarding Jewish people. He had some, yeah, you know, everyone talks about his anti-Semitism, but he's not your traditional anti-Semitic that just um, you know, dislikes non-whites, and you know, there's a lot of those people too. But he had really a fa fanatical, psychotic obsession with uh, many things, um, including Jewish people, and um, really lost his mind. So he he probably had severe bipolar disorder. Was he autistic? You think? Yeah, there were some some thoughts about that too. He he had a lot of uh, really perseverative, obsessive behaviors, which can be seen. In people with autism, um, certainly he would be considered a high-functioning autistic person if he was. But mm -hmm. I suspect he was just more manic. Actually, uh, even as a child, he, he didn't. Usually, children don't develop uh, full-blown bipolar disorder when they're young, but they might have features of that, and then sort of obsessive, just fanatical study or um, uh, focus. Yeah, it can be a uh, sign of mania in some people. And he died of kidney failure, I think, which is also interesting because, um, well, uh, never mind. <laughs> a lot of risk factors for that, but uh, some include uh, smoking and uh, some psychiatric medicines. Why do people, people keep playing E4? You mean against me or in life? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Actually, um, best by test. E4 is a, a great opening. I, I started with E4. Um, I think that there's a lot of equal and very well tested out positions in E4. Um, so if you're looking to play something sort of safe and known that you can study for, E4 has probably got more lines like that. I found D4 to be more flexible. Um, which for me is good. Uh, that's what I wanted, but you know, whatever suits you. Um, so E4 had a lot more forcing lines. And I think when I was uh, coming up, I found that E4 was a fun player to beat older people 
I did it all the time as white. Um, but when then I was on the receiving end and I was black and I was getting older, I didn't ever really want to play some of these super sharp openings as black against the white players. Uh, for instance, the, the Sicilian, the Nidorf, um, even the Roy Lopez has a lot of very kind of sharp and complicated lines. And I didn't really want to be playing a computer um, that they studied and memorized and prepared for. I wanted to have them think and beat me on their own. So I, I thought there was more lines in D4 that required some um, understanding that I could actually use against younger uh, computer generation kids. Good question. And what's your thoughts on the uh, bonk lout? Uh, E4, E5, King E2, King E7. <laughs> I haven't assayed that opening yet uh, for people that don't know what that is. Um, that is this opening. And then and there, I think there's some other kind of bond cloud, which is like even venturing forward. I'm not sure. But it's a way to just be goofy and, and play something that's sort of like trolling your opponent and saying, I can play whatever I want, doesn't matter. Um, Hikaru Nakamura is famous for this. Um, you know, there was a game played between um, Fisher and Short, early '90s, and this was actually played. Uh, what you just, what you just did, yeah. F3, E4, King F2. Uh, I thought and maybe Fisher it was a long cloud too. This is another kind of sort of junk move people play just for fun. And, and actually, there was a Grandmaster game. I think it was. I don't remember who played it, but um, they played this to troll their opponent, and then their opponent plays this, and then the next move was this. And then this, and then they played some normal opening from there. Uh, so the black player refused to accept that trolling opening and they trolled themselves. That's what I was asking, yeah. I'm, I was curious to hear what you think. I asked Franklin um, if he thinks white is lost after e4, e5, king, e2. And he said, probably. <laughs> that was an interest. Anyway, I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean. Go. In a serious game, probably, yeah. But anybody under 2,000 could probably play it and, and potentially win if you're a better player. Fair enough. Yeah, Mark, uh, my first opening, I, I played E4 uh, as white in my early years. Um, you know, sort of Ray Lopez stuff or scotch uh, like this or like this. Um, you know, the reason why I really started disliking this was actually this move um, and this move, which back then there weren't computers and there weren't books on this kind of thing. And it's just a very aggravating opening to play against. It's very complicated. Um, I played a few 2000 rated players that just got positions that I was uncomfortable with. And, you know, this is move three. I don't, want, I don't want to be out of book and uncomfortable on move three. So I didn't uh, like these positions and kind of um, fell out of favor for me. Um, as black, I played, um, played a lot of Sicilian, um, played a lot of French. Um, as, as black against this, I played mostly the um, Kings Indian. Um, when I was starting to learn, Kasparov was very active, and so I loved watching his games, and those were always really exciting to me. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't play this too much anymore, but I still have fun with it uh, sometimes. Uh, How did you transition to, like, D4 for white or to your current black repertoire? Like, did you just sort of study one by one every time you go through new openings, or did you go to, like, a tournament, and you're just like, I'm going to try out X today or something, or... That's a great question, you know, and you're probably gonna think I'm crazy and you don't believe me, but I just started playing it. Um, <laughs> and it was at the Pittsburgh Chess Club and I hadn't really been playing much in years. I played in the Pittsburgh Chess League for a couple of years, but you know, that's like five, six games a year. Um, so I was rusty, I didn't know what I was doing and I just started playing D4. And I'd seen a lot of games just from watching chess and, and um, and, you know, just kind of following tournaments. So I, I had some vague ideas, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing, that's for sure. Um, and I just started playing it. And I would research and look up the openings and the games that I won and lost and try to learn from those. 
I gradually sort of figured out a repertoire. I played a lot of different things as D4. Um, uh, anything from sort of very calm openings to Trompowski openings to uh, Fianchetto type openings. Um, and I just sort of saw what, uh, what my flavor was. Nowadays, I mostly play uh, kind of traditional D4 and C4 openings. Um, I've, I've dabbled with uh, these F3 lines um, in, in several different positions. Uh, this, this was the game I gave you guys at the beginning of the game. That's sort of an F3 line, uh, which you can also get into the same Mitch King's Indian. Um, and you can also get it in the in the in this opening. This is another F3 line. Um, I kind of like it. I always found these lines kind of annoying as black. So you know, you just when you play different things, if you don't get too stodgy with your openings, then you get to see what's uncomfortable for you. And you know, when I when I used to play this kind of stuff. I played a blitz game against Ben Feingold in Michigan against us. He played F3 against me. I was like, what the hell is this? What am I supposed to do against this move? I didn't know this move. <laughs> I don't know what I played. I played, you know, this and this and this. And, and he, he absolutely annihilated me. <laughs> he never took on A6. I, I didn't understand that at all. He played like this and something else. And he just maintained a piece or a pawn on B5 ever got any kind of fun activity and i just was staring at this pawn chain the whole game and thinking that's really annoying what am i supposed to do about that uh it totally restricts me from getting any activity over there so um you know i never would have learned that lesson if i hadn't played some benko stuff mel you can attest to the fact that we played a bunch of games with this type of opening and you know I, i've learned some strategies to how to contain black in that opening by being beat myself. So, you know, I think don't be afraid to play openings that are, are new to you. Uh, it's good to have some vague ideas, but nothing's better than sitting there and analyzing a game when you're under pressure and playing in a tournament for learning some of the basics of it and, and then studying the position later. So, you know, another example of me doing that, which I think I learned a lot from, which I don't, I don't play that much anymore, but is, um, is let's see how we get there. Mm. Now let me flip it. So this opening, um, and just to kind of give you some some basics, you know, this would be kind of a common set up right so th this this kind of opening i would often play as white because i kind of prefer the isolani pawn um white to me it just seemed seemed natural you know you got this isolated pawn you got some pressure on the pawn in front of it seems like it kind of makes sense what you do to try to get some pressure on it but um it's very useful to play this kind of position as black too um, and the, the place I've gotten most of my practice is in the French defense. When people do this, and then they do this, and this, and this, and I play that. And now suddenly, I'm playing the isolated pawn. And just briefly, you know, this kind of opening. Um, normally, I wouldn't like to play. It's not my style, but it's been very educational. And I probably play both sides better now that I've played this kind of opening before. So don't don't shy away from certain pawn structures. You know, play play the fianchettos, play the isolated pawns, play it all. The more you play, the better. I, I see a lot of players in the chess club. Um, let me just see who's who's still on here. <laughs> Not too many people, just a couple. Um, I, I see a number of players that are really stodgy with their openings. They've been playing the same stuff for the last five years, and they play it okay, but they don't 
playing great and they don't progress, their rating doesn't go up. So I think that's a mistake. Um, I think that if you, I mean, Mel and me have been playing um, for you know, four or five years and we've had some great battles. You know, we're, we're roughly equivalent rating. I uh, got them by a little bit, but in any case, you know, great, great chess. You know, what opening do I play though? Mel, I mean, I played a bunch of stuff against you and that helps a lot because that way he doesn't prepare for the exact line that he knows I'm coming with. And yeah, that's very true. If I've had an advantage over him, it's probably that he doesn't know what I'm coming with, but he, he's a little more predictable with his opening. So I, I can kind of think about maybe what I want more. And um, that's something that I learned as a kid when I was playing in high school because I'd play in the chess club in Michigan and, you know, play with the same guys and, and they would have this kind of static repertoire. And so I'd go and I'd buy a book and I'd read it and I'd learn some lines and I'd come and I'd just pummel them. And it was great. It felt like cheating because, you, you know, you kind of know what's coming. But the thing is, that's what chess is. You can cheat. You can prepare all you want. And, uh, you know, people play the stuff they play natural moves which are in these games and and uh you know you think about it, you prepare ahead of time you're a better player so i definitely recommend trying different things and never being too too predictable with what you play even if it's objectively not great if it's not the line they prepared for you you've got a chance Let's see, Ralph and Jules, I don't know you guys, but any kind of questions that you um, have based on what you saw, or, or I, I don't know what your level is, but anything you'd want to add or ask? Maybe they're, they're, maybe they're muted, I don't know. Okay, well, um, thanks for everybody's attention, the good questions. Nice to see you, Mel, and, and uh, thanks for Ralph and Lawrence and Jules for joining. and. And uh, sign off now. Thanks oh, again, uh, Kevin. Great Kevin, there, there is one more question. Uh, oh, I missed it. The Q and A. Did you answer that? Uh, no. What is it? What software do you use to study, record games, etc.? Oh, I missed that. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, I use. Uh, actually, you might be able to see it here. Skid. S C I D. It's developed by a dude named Shane. It's free. You can just Google Skid Chess Database. I love it. As you can see, I loaded a bunch of my games in here. Um, you can do Stockfish too. So you can see right here, you know, what the um, computer evaluation is. You can notate it. This is my game against Mellows back against. Well, this is just me just goofing around, I guess, but. Um, yeah, so in this game, I, I put a little notation here when I was analyzing and I said, okay, if I want to play this one, then that's not so good, you know, for that reason. Um, yeah, it's good. People use chess base too, but, um, I think that costs something. Uh, I prefer to have it downloaded on my computer rather than a cloud. All right. Thanks guys. See y'all later and uh, Mark, see you next week. Thanks Kevin. Yeah. Thanks guys. Bye.